So I've had a, I'm, I'm, I'm on a, I guess I call it experiential overload, which probably doesn't take much at this age and stage, but uh, this past, these last four days, it ended last night, three days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday up at Gunstock in Guilford, New Hampshire, southern end of Lake Winnipesaukee, beautiful area. They have, once again, this Christian music weekend called Soul Fest. And a number of people that I know have gone, some of them for years. I don't know how many years they've been doing this thing, but it's quite a while. And uh, so Lois and I, they offered free tickets to pastors. There's incentive. So uh, my son Tom went two years ago, and then they canceled it last year because of COVID. They did it again this year. So I am, you can't tell this because of a telescopic effect, but I am partway up the mountain and I zoomed in on the stage and the band that's playing here, you can't tell in the picture, they all have very long black hair. And if you, uh, if you follow, I look around the room, not many of you do, if you follow Christian hard rock, the band's called a disciple. And I'm not a, I love the term disciple, it's a great biblical term. I'm not a fan of the band Disciple, uh, but there are thousands that are. I, am. <laughs> <laughs> I was first exposed to Disciple in my son Chris's car because he's playing a CD that I'm not familiar with. And I'm going, who's this? And he told me. So then when I was there, I actually recognized a couple of the tunes you had played. Um, it was an experience, partly because I am... I'm going to guess, for lack of judgment, I am 1,500, 2,000 feet up the mountain. And I sent Chris an audio video from my phone and so he could hear me. I'm holding my phone, taking the video, and I'm going, I'm yelling to the top of my voice, this is for you, Chris. And I didn't know whether my phone would pick it up. It was that loud 2,000 feet away. And I've, I love bass. Uh, Steve's our great bass guitar player. I used to play bass guitar. I love bass. I used to think there's no such thing as too much bass. I learned differently. The, probably with a half a mile radius of that mountain, everything was shaking. I don't know how much amplification power and what they had, but Tom has heard a lot of these bands, my son Tom, and he goes, I've never heard, excuse me, felt bass like this. So just to show you how real it was, they have all the porta potties lined up. You go in a porta potty, the whole place is vibrating. I mean, it's just. It's an experience to use a porta potty with that much bass. It's just. It's an experience I don't really want to repeat. But so they had these different genres of bands. Disciple was the hard band. Then they had a break in the stage, and we had a Hispanic gal, Blanca. Any of you familiar with Blanca? I've heard her on Christian radio, whatever. Great voice, great singer. And um, so she did Hispanic set, did some Spanish pieces. Uh, Tom's wife, Ginger, knows Spanish. She looks up the words. Lois is working on Spanish, so it's kind of cute. We're, we're halfway up the mountain, and Lois and Ginger are singing in Spanish with Blanca. At, it's, it's, and I went, wow, we went from disciple to Blanca. I don't know how you, it's like going into time zones or space zones. And then we had a guy I was more familiar with, Corey Asbury, who has a number of songs on Christian radio. And I guess, for lack of a better term, I call him uh, Christian Southern Gospel Rock. That worked for any of you familiar with him? Something like that. Good band. He was extremely ADD, so I liked him. Um, it was great. And then we drove home fighting to keep our eyes open late at night. So it was quite an experience for, for one day. But it got me thinking once again about worship. What is God looking for? Because these three groups in a row offered a wide range of music styles. Um, the band that came on and went late into the night, Tom, I, I wasn't familiar with them, but Tom said, they're kind of Irish, but they dress weird. Okay, so that's different. Um, and then they were having Casting Crowns last night, which I missed. And I love Casting Crowns, their music. Worship. What is, what is worship? Then yesterday, I don't have pictures for this. I was surprised. I went to my 50th class reunion. Yes, I am that old. And uh, the organizers did a great job putting it together. We went at Crescent Beach State Park. It was, it was actually a perfect place for it because it, it was cooking hot inland, and it was really nice there. And 
I'd say out of the 75 so, we probably had 45, 50 out of a class of 109 that were there. Most of them I haven't seen in 50 years. And they would put up our class pictures all around the, the venue where we had it, the indoor park. And then you had a name tag with your picture on it from 1971. And uh, most were not recognizable. That's one way of wording it. Some of you may be watching on Facebook. I love you, even if you're not recognizable. And you may have thought the exact same thing about me. And uh, Lois was a trooper because she knew all of, I think, three people there. My brother, Reg, his wife. <laughs> Because Reggie's wife, Jan, and I were in the same class, and then my best friend I grew up with, Paul. So, so it, was, it was interesting, and then they shared some stories and different things, and I talked to a number of them. And my, my, my takeaway from that was some of them have changed in looks, but they really are pretty much the same person I knew 50 years ago. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Am I the same person I was 50 years ago? Don't answer quickly, Lois, or kids, or whatever. Um, where do, what, how does that work? Do people really change? What was interesting, and I said this to the worship team, was one of the guys came up to me that was in my class, obviously, and we were friends, but we weren't close friends, and I have not seen him since graduation day. No idea where his path left. He talked a little bit about that and asked me, and I told him I'm a pastor. And he goes... That is great. Most people don't respond that way. I, I think it's interesting. They find out I've been a pastor. They don't know what to do with it. They just, it's just like, I don't know. It's like, please wear a mask and walk away or something. You know, like it's, it could be contagious. Um, but he, he said, well, we're involved. There's several of us here that are involved in a Bible study group. We're going through Colossians right now. And I went, that is awesome. I, I didn't see that coming. He volunteers for hospice. Uh, down at the Gosnell House in Scarborough. I said, that is awesome that you're doing those things. I talked about, you know, ministry and I'm fire chaplain and stuff. And I thought, I don't know where he was 50 years ago, but in the five, ten minutes we talked, we connected. We connected differently than some of my other classmates that talked maybe for more than 15, 20 minutes or whatever. What was the difference? Now, you might say, well, if we'd both been into motorcycles, or we'd both been into hiking, or we were offshore boaters, or whatever. The, you know, when you have a common denominator, yeah, of course you can talk about stuff. But there's a difference, and you know this. There's a difference when you're talking face-to-face -face with another believer in Christ. There's a difference. There is a connection that isn't there when you're talking to a person that's never put their faith in Christ. Faces change to people. So I want to look at worship a little bit today. Again, I talked about stewardship and worship. And I, I find, for me, this is how God's working in my heart. When I, when I work on a message, uh, first of all, I have to answer the question, what do these scriptures mean to me? What, what is God saying to me through His Word? How does this work? And of course, by Friday being there at Soul Fest, in the evening, I, I forgot what they said, 10,000 people there in the evening for that concert, just going all up the side of that mountain. And it's, it's, that was very moving to me. Blanca's testimony to the audience that afternoon was very moving, her life experience and how Jesus had changed her life, changed her dad's life. And uh, Lois just started weeping. It was powerful. But I think, is this just an emotional experience, or is God doing something? Because nothing wrong with emotional experiences, but where is God here? That's my, that was my question. Is God here with the long black hair, head-shaking disciple band? Was he there with Hispanic Blanca? Is he there with me? What's going on? So I started thinking about Jesus and worship. I do believe this from my study of Scripture. I think all of the human race is wired, we're hardwired from the get-go for worship. Why would that be so? Think of your Bibles a little bit. Why would I be hardwired to worship something or someone? 
I'm created in God's image to have a personal relationship with Him. The very fact of, of creation means God made me with the capacity, the desire to know Him and experience Him in a relationship we call worship. But we don't, that, that capacity can go in a million directions. We worship things, we worship other people. As I watch, especially some of the young people with these bands, and I thought, are they worshiping God or are they worshiping the musician? Now, if I ask them point blank, I'm sure the Christian kids would definitely say, no, we do not worship band players. We worship Jesus. But I think, what's going on there? You remember in Revelation, what does John do with one of the angels? Do you remember what he does? He's blown away by what the angel has revealed to him. And he falls down and starts to worship the angel. Now, an angel's quite a being, i got to admit. If I were right here and one of God's power angels was before me, it would blow me out of the water. And the angel says, no, don't do it. Worship God. And I think, but the human heart, we're prone to wander. The old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. To worship happens when something or someone captivates our hearts that central part, our core our emotions. So the question I had to ask myself as I go away from whether it's Soul Fest with top-notch musicianship, the whole thing, or if I'm here with us, you, our little church family and the little old Durham me, what, does Jesus captivate my heart? Pastor Rick has helped me with this probably as much as any human being on the planet although certain people on the radio have helped me and their different personalities over the years. It's not just a personality thing, but it's that central question is what really grabs my heart. So as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about where does Jesus talk about this? Because I'd like to hear Jesus talking about worship, not just, and, and, and no offense to me, but you need to hear Jesus talking about worship, not just me. What does Jesus say? And um, it came to me. Yeah, he does talk about this. So he's, he's talking to the woman at the well, the story of the woman at the well in Samaria, and the disciples have gone away. So just he and she are talking. I've been to what they think is that Jacob's well in Samaria. I don't think you can go there now because it's part of the West Bank, but when I went there years ago, you could go there. And you're up in the hills. It's, it, it's, it's one of the slightly more New england -y parts of Israel. So I think of Jesus sitting there with this woman, and he's talking, and he, he talks about, you know, going home to your husband. Well, I don't have a husband, Jesus. And she says, oh, I think you're a prophet. I don't, that part of the discussion is not germane to where I, wanna, I want Jesus' words. So that's interesting. But I jump in where the woman says to Jesus, sir, I see that you are a prophet. And then it's like she's trying to figure out who he is, so when you're trying to learn something, as I did yesterday at the reunion, I, you know, someone walks up and I'd say, hey, you're retired, what are you doing? Almost all of them were. And I'm so ticked off, no, I'm not, just kidding. Anyway, I said, what are you doing? Busier than ever, yeah, you'll love retirement, you'll hate retirement, they all had an opinion. Anyway, but you ask people questions, so she's kind of messing with Jesus here. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Great question. How does this worship place work? Jesus answers her, and this is what's key. Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship, when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now, I went into my resources to read some commentaries on the, this part of Jesus' answer. And you know what I found? Nothing helpful. So we'll skip that. <laughs> but this next part is different. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers, and some of you are familiar with this, but I hope this morning you will engage your brains and your heart in a different way so these words really get to you. Worshipers will worship the Father how? In spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in the spirit and in truth. 
So I was thinking about that. Whether it's Soul Fest, whether it's here. We've got in our in our region we have big churches that have state of the art bands, state of the art stages, but there's home home groups, small churches. Most of the pastors I know pastor churches of less than two hundred. There are I don't know the big gun guys, but most of the pastors I know pastor smallish churches. What what's worship? How does this work? Here's the rest of that discourse, and this is I think it's meant to be pivotal in this. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now, I love the NIV, but the NIV doesn't, and, and it's not my opinion, but with the Greek, they don't get this just right. Literally, Jesus answers her, in a phrase that even though she, the Samaritans had a mixed faith, she would have known what he was saying. I am who speaks to you. Where do we get the phrase, I am? F familiar Bible, the burning bush in Exodus. Moses is there. We think he's 80 years old. He's been bumming around the wilderness for 40 years, tending sheep, been kicked out of Egypt. And he comes to this bush that's burning. No big deal, but it doesn't burn up. It keeps burning. And he interacts more mysterious than that, there's a voice out of the bush. I mean, you know, this is a weird deal. Who shall I say sent me? And you remember how God answers him? Tell them I am. Now, Jewish superstition is messed with that. You can't say it. And the irony of it, it's exactly what God said, this is what you say. And then the, uh, the real conservative Jewish groups will not pronounce that. And then we have it spun off into a variety of things. But here Jesus says it very clearly. I am. I'm, we think Messiah will come. I am. I'm, this, is, this is it. I'm here. God is here. And he's, but they've been talking about this in the context of worship. So what does it mean? Here my resources actually help me. Therefore, worship in spirit does not refer to the human spirit. It is worship that is dynamically animated by God's Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think that means that some people will dance before the Lord. I think that's great. I'm not a dancer. I think so. I, if I dance before the Lord, it would not help you in worship, okay? It would be a problem. You would say, get him out of here. Um, but so we can get emotional. Whether you do or don't, that's not the point. So stay with me here. Such worship in spirit and truth means that we do not have a catalog of two features here, okay, spirit and truth but one inseparable concept. And this is how they explain it. Three parts. It's, it's one process, but there's three parts to it. And this helped me, and I'm, I'm praying this will help you. One, it's empowered by God. Empowered. Something gives it energy, gives it power, gives it life. Two, it's informed. It's not, I'm not doing this without a, a knowledge base. I, there's a knowledge of what's going on here by the revelation of God and... Three, provided to humans by the one who is the truth, Jesus Christ. This is from a resource. It's been, it's been around for over 20 years because I've used it for over 20 years, the NIV application commentary. So I want, I want to take this apart a little bit, hopefully clarify it with Scripture with the goal, because this is my goal for me, I'm sharing with you, that we become better it sounds funny, but still, better worshipers. Some people, and, and you see it even in our little peeps, some people raise their hands. If you do, it doesn't mean you're worshiping because your hands are up or your hands are down. It, it may be a physical response. Raising holy hands is an absolutely scriptural, both mandate. I, I'm, that's, I'm really good with that. I didn't grow up with that. But I grew up with an audience that was very responsive. When I was a kid going to church here, people said, Amen, Hallelujah. Um, and and, not, and not the meetings, I thought, weren't that inspiring for either Amens or Hallelujahs. But they still did it. And it still worked. And I praise God for the, the two ministers I sat under when I was here. They were the Lord. They had different spiritual gifts, different personalities. But they helped point me to a Savior and to the cross where He died for me. Let's look at this. Empowered by God. Paul's words help explain this. And I don't know where you are physically as well as spiritually. 
But I think as Paul wrestled with the dynamics of the spiritual energy it takes to live the Christian life and minister the Christian story, as well as just the challenges to, for some of us to get going, <laughs> the body fights us in the morning, whatever, Paul would say this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay or earthen vessels to show something. This all-surpassing power, we're empowered by God in our worship, this all-surpassing power is from whom? It's from God and not from us. And then he says, if, to make sure you get this, let me explain it. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed. What does it mean to be perplexed? I don't know what's going on. I don't get it. We live in a time of great perplexion, globally, not just us in a little church. Globally, there's a lot of confusion of what's going on, politically, the health crisis, all of this stuff. We're perplexed, but what's the response because of Christ? Not in despair. Whatever they, wherever they go with the next COVID rules, I'm not going to be in despair over it. I'll be perplexed, as we all are, but I'm not in despair over it. I know my Jesus. Persecuted, I've experienced very little of that. But if we were to be, and I think the day is coming when we will be, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. And this is his, I call it pictograph of what he means. We always carry around in our body something unusual. And uh, as I go over this, I'm reminded of the communion experience that we have. We always carry about our body what? The death of Christ. I thought, what? I wouldn't have written it that way. There's a lot of Scripture, by the way. I wouldn't have written it that way. That's why God didn't have me write Scripture. It would have been a disaster. But Paul knew what he was saying here. We always carry about in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Conclusion. If there's a therefore there, what is the therefore therefore? It's his conclusion statement. Therefore, even though you may be hammered by loads of discouraging things, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly, we are wasting away. Yet inwardly, we are being what? Renewed day by day. This is, this is part of the worship experience is the renewal. This is, this is what I feel God's working on in my heart and life. The renewal, the renewal that happens when my focus is on Christ. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. The Greek, it's, this, is, this verse is translated different ways. But I, the, there is something heavy going on here. That's what's built into this. Achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do we do? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is what? Temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. I love 2 Corinthians 4. You might want to write that one down. Go back, read the whole chapter. This, and again, it's the whole flow of the letter, but what's going on here? Now, I don't think he's specifically, maybe, thinking about worship or not. I don't know that. But to me, it very much tied into that to be empowered by God in our worship. The second one, informed by the Bible. Where do you get your information? Where do you get your information? I, I, the, the age we live in where you and I, I want to know something? How many steps? My phone's not secure. I just opened it up, by the way. So, just so you know. And I touch this. Navigate to Shiloh Chapel, Durham, Maine. And what's it going to do? It says I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> okay? And it's got a map. It's got me really close. But um, it's still calculating. It knows I'm really close. <laughs> One minute, zero feet. Who would have thought of that? Who on earth would have thought of that? 
if you know part of a verse, if you think of just a phrase of a Bible verse, you can do that same thing, and it'll probably come up with it in a couple seconds. Um, assuming you have an internet connection, um, which is interesting. I was talking to one of my classmates, and they moved to the mountains of Virginia. And then they realized when they were there, guess what they had for internet? Nothing. Guess what they had for cell phone? Nothing. And they said, we couldn't live there. I thought, isn't this fascinating where we are now? We couldn't live there. We have to have these things. Do we have to have them? We think we have to have all this information. <clears throat> the Bible is the revelation of God. Not just revelation is the revelation of God. All 66 books is God revealed to us. Some of it isn't exactly helpful. When you're going through names in the Old Testament, if you get a blessing out of that, good for you. I don't. Can't pronounce them. Um, as one of my college profs said when we were trying to read some out loud, he goes, they're all dead. We don't know how they pronounced them either. Just go for it. Give it your best shot. So we do. But anyway, the Bible itself is God's Word. I love this verse. I think Paul wrote it. It's in Hebrews. We don't know the author. For the Word of God is what? Alive. The Word of God is alive. It's living. And this is very real to little old me because I get called out to a home where someone was alive and they're not. And I, I, I've got all these different pictures in my mind of these calls I've been on. And it's not PTSDing me. I'm okay. My heart goes out. I have uh, Somebody was doing on Facebook an empathy chart. And 100%, anyone see that on Facebook? I think Jen was 100% empathetic empath, whatever the word is. Um, yeah, she cares about people. And I said, well, that's true. I didn't dare take it. <laughs> but alive is a very precious thing. Life is a very precious thing. The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, because that's only, the only thing he could come up with that would be meaningful to his audience. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. There is no other book, there's no other words on earth that have that kind of power. It doesn't exist. I have an acquaintance, a friend, that believes all faiths are basically the same. We have not had a lengthy discussion yet. But we probably will, because they're not the same. And I would say to her, most religions contain some truth, but Jesus made an exclusive claim that He is truth. Not just says truth, He is truth. What are you going to do with that? I don't know. And that's why we come back to point three, provided by Jesus. Provided to humans, from this is from the study notes, by the one who is the truth, Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, I, I, I memorized it 20-some years ago. I was familiar with it before then. But it, it just as I talk with people, this verse keeps coming back to me because Jesus says these exclusive claims. I am the way, not a way, not a good idea. I am the way. And He is truth. And He is life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When I was introduced to C.S. Lewis, he explained that passage. These are the words of an, a maniac deceiver or they're actual words that are true. You, you can't have it either way. He either was a nutcase or he's speaking truth. My heart, my experience shows, of course, he was speaking truth. And then Jesus said these words, John chapter 10. I, John chapter 10, if you've never read that or if you haven't read it in a long time, it's a long chapter. I'll give you a heads up. Most of the chapters in the Gospel of John are long. But Jesus has been challenged by the, the religious authorities <laughs> and he just, I call it, unloads on them. And the more he talked, the more ticked off they got. And yet he was telling them exactly what they needed to hear. Exactly. The thief, that's Satan, comes only to do three things. What's he do? Steal, kill, and destroy. If that's happening, if that's happening in a relationship, if that's happening physically, if that, wherever that's happening, those are the fingerprints of Satan. You can identify him. That's not mysterious. That's how it works. And we then know how to pray. I have come for something different. They may have life, 
And the translators, we can't get the full impact of this next phrase. Have it to the full. Have it ab more abundantly. It's, it's something that's really, there's a lot of it. It's not just a little. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd, he's the only one that could do this and pay the price, lays down his life for the sheep. That's our Jesus. Then Paul would write these words. Interesting, my, my high school classmates studying Colossians. Since then, you have been raised. If you put your faith in Christ, and you've, especially we just had the baptism, you witnessed that reenactment, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If you have been raised with Christ, then this is the response. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So Paul is saying, our heart and our mind, or whoops, we, I point to here because that's where the beating organ is. But the heart is the spiritual part. The mind is the mental part. It's got oxygenated blood right at the moment, so I'm able to talk and think. If that were to stop for some reason, I couldn't. But my spiritual part's eternal. But both of these, let's bring them together. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. <clears throat> and when I was going over these verses, I was thinking of the people, four people got baptized a couple weeks ago. You died. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That is such a powerful thing to know. The, the, that's why the, the second point here was that we're empowered by God, but informed by the Bible. We, this is the true revelation. My life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, who is your life? Jesus. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. This is not all there is to it. So those are the three things, empowered by God, informed by His Word, provided literally by Christ and through His Spirit. And that, is, that has helped me, and we're going to sing a worship song that is a prayer, Lord, I Need You. I love that song. We've sung it now. Some of these songs we've dated, I uh, didn't in this one, because we struggled with finding the right key, and we finally come up with a key that seems to work for everybody. We will date it. Final decision, April 2016. And so when somebody says, I don't know who would ever do this, but somebody would say, is that the key we've done it in? Then those of us that document things go, ha ha, April 2016, we decided. That's a silly rule, but anyway. There comes the place where you know something. As Pastor Rick would say, you know that you know. So I don't know where you are in your, I call it your worship experience. You may be nervous about people showing emotion in worship. I used to be. I didn't understand it. Uh, I'm certainly far less that way now because emotions, emotions, one, show us we have a pulse. Um, two, God gave us emotions and He Himself emotes. That's who He is. So as we sing this in closing, I, I, my prayer is, this will be your prayer. Lord, I need you. And then even as we pray that, we're connecting with Him, mind and heart, in worship. Amen? So stand with us, please. Lord, I know you've heard that from our hearts, our prayer. We do need you. Sometimes that's just part of the process of life is when we finally start realizing how much we need you. We think we can figure it out on our own and pull it off on our own. And, and uh, once in a while we do, and that only makes it worse because then we think we can do anything. And then we eh, fall down hard, and you pick us back up, and you brush off, the just like a parent with a kid, brush off the dirt and say, now that wasn't such a good idea, was it? You are the gracious, faithful, loving God. You never let go of us. You said you'd never leave us or forsake us. I thank you. I have that knowledge. I have that assurance. I have that peace. It's not, it's not because of me. It's all because of you that I have these things. My faith in you is, even that's a gift, Scripture would tell us. Maybe there's someone watching that, that's the, wow, I wish I could have that too. My life is a mess. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Come to Jesus right now, simply, humbly, honestly. That's, that's all it means. He already knows you better than you know yourself, knows me better than I know my, myself. And He loves us with that deep, unstoppable love. 
but he wants us to actually come and receive to say, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, I believe you are that Savior. You took my sins on yourself on the cross and therefore I come and receive you as my Lord, as my Savior and help me to grow in you, to read the Bible, to start knowing you better, that I find my heart is responding in worship when I wake up in the morning, when I, I, I find myself worshiping all through the day because I see your hand even when things are troubling, even when the news is on and it's bad. No, there's a sovereign God who is watching over all this, and I have peace. Jesus, only you can offer that. And if you've touched someone's heart this morning, I pray you'll help them to reach out to me or someone here and that we can encourage them in their new walk with you. Thank you that you always are there for us. You'll never leave us or forsake us. Just that phrase alone is so powerful. People come and go. People change or don't change, all of that. But you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, the writer of Hebrews would say. You are always the same. We love you, Lord. We worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Amen? Well, we will close this part of the service. As you see on our screen, in literally in just a few minutes, we're going to have a very short, I think it will be a record-setting, hopefully, record-setting short business meeting because we have to make a tweak in the bylaws, just a tweak, and we need enough people. If you are a member, you can't vote if you're not a member, uh, but you can be a member. You, uh, the requirements for membership in our church is you put your faith in Christ. You know you're a born-again follower of Jesus, and that you followed him through the waters of baptism. doesn't mean you have to have been baptized by me personally, but I will be available to do that if someone so chooses. There's water in my pool. If you want baptism, let me know. We can do that this afternoon. And, uh, but those are, I believe that was how it worked with the early church. They put faith in Christ, they were baptized, they were part of the church. Then comes the growing experience. We all learn and grow as we go along. But we're going to just take a, literally about five minutes so you can stretch and get ready. Don will have it on the screen, what we're voting on. That's, it's, it's, what is it, two words, Don? Okay. Okay. It's, it's still going to be brief. You'll have plenty of time to get to McDonald's before the rush is there, okay? So um, we will, five off, if you're a member, be here. If you're not a member, you can sit here and watch how we do this. It's always educational, um, okay? So let's just take a break for five minutes. I'm assuming we've been off the air now, right, Don?